Hi, students. Uh, this is our final week of the psychology of adult development class, and I want to, you know, make a few closing thoughts that you might take home with you uh, after this course is done. So let me just pull up a. This is kind of a series of notes that I've made uh, this morning concerning the entire semester. Okay, and so things that you probably want to remember. Uh, after you leave this course, okay? And they apply to your own life and the lives of your loved ones as well and to other people who are in, you know, the adulthood stage, okay? All right. Um, we want to remember that everybody is individually different. Um, you know, others may have different personalities than ours. Um, and we understand that personality is thought to be uh, relatively stable over the lifespan. Uh, we also know that others have different cognitive capabilities than we do. Some people have really good memories, some people don't. Um, some people are e e able to uh, use language very fluently and others can't. Uh, and so all of the cognitive functions that you can think of, like decision making and problem solving and language and, you know, sensory perception and memory, uh, all of those things are different between people, okay? Uh, also, social functioning is different between people in that, you know, some people are really good at, uh, you know, getting into the crowd and and communicating and shaking hands and meeting people while others are less um, adept at that, okay? Uh, and, you know, the way others kind of affect the way we think and behave is very important in the adult lifespan because, you know, although we may have some close friends uh, and relatives that we socialize with uh, on a regular basis, there may be others who you know, we don't socialize as much with, all right? And so people are very individual, individually different in, in social functioning. And also when you think about culture, you know, we have a culture here, we have several cultures in America, don't we? Uh, but all around the world, culture, uh, cultures are different between people, okay? And we have to understand that as, uh, you know, in our psychological understanding of people. Now, as I said, personality is something that is, uh, uh, you know, it's thought to be relatively stable over time and it's kind of a dispositional trait, okay? But I'll talk about that in a minute. But personality really relates to your mental and your physical health, okay? Uh, and you've read in the book, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, certain types of personalities uh, have different kinds of outcomes in, in terms of their health, okay? Um, personality also relates to the way you function socially and how you function within your relationships, okay? And so if you think that personality is an enduring kind of a stable Thing that occurs across the adult lifespan, then uh, you have to think that personality affects your uh, ability to socialize and become close to, you know, people in other in relationships. Okay. Uh, in the book, you know, you had several chapters on cognition. Uh, really, there are four basic mechanisms uh, when we think about cognition. And they all kind of interrelate, okay? Uh, how well does your vision and hearing work? Okay, that's sensory functioning. Uh, if your vision is not so good and you don't have corrective kinds of glasses or contacts or something like that, that's going to affect uh, your ability to, you know, um, memorize scenes or events. It's also going to affect your ability to, uh, um, you know, understand what's being transmitted in terms of information to you, okay? And so the senses play a, a really big role in the way you function cognitively, 
Okay. Now we know that processing speed is also an important cognitive basic mechanism. Uh, what we have is uh, sort of a, an architecture uh, in our minds uh, that consists of neurons and neuron connections, right? And so how efficiently our neurons transmit signals to other neurons in our brain uh, has to do with our ability to process uh, information and sensory signals and all kinds of things uh, efficiently and quickly, okay? So that's processing speed. And it has a lot to do with our ability to uh, think and, uh, and behave and communicate, okay? And so processing speed uh, affects your ability to say, have a conversation uh, without too much problem, right? Your verbal fluency should be pretty good if your brain is processing information uh, quickly and efficiently. Okay, so that's processing speed. Um, inhibition is the third basic cognitive mechanism that's talked about in research and your ability to inhibit some information while focusing on uh, the task at hand or the information at hand is really important. This is kind of a frontal lobe uh, situation uh, where we inhibit uh, information, okay? And so if you're an older adult, and like I've said this before, in a crowded cafeteria or something like that, a buffet, uh, and it's noisy, right? And you're trying to have a conversation with uh, someone else, um, your ability to kind of tune out the noise and concentrate on the conversation depends on your ability to inhibit irrelevant information. So inhibition is important across the adult lifespan. Working memory is also another basic cognitive mechanism. Uh, you know what short-term memory is. It's just kind of a a passive storage system where we hold bits of information in mind. And then if we don't do anything with those bits of information, they kind of decay, right? But if we start to rehearse the information that we're taking in from the world, then we're working, right? We're working on these short-term bits of information and we're coming up with a strategy to remember the situation or to remember the information. And this is called working memory, okay? So all four of these basic cognitive mechanisms come into play um, in terms of the way we think and behave, all right? Social functioning. I talked a little bit about this at the end or toward the end of the semester. And we talked about socio-emotional selectivity theory, okay? There are two central components in that theory, and that is how much time do I have left in life? That's a time perspective. And then also, what are my primary motivations in life? Is it information gathering, which would probably occur uh, in younger adulthood, or is it emotion regulation, which occurs after uh, the point in time where you perceive time left in life is limited, okay? And so this is an interesting theory that fits uh, many, many people, okay? You just did a project on this. Um, also, in terms of social functioning, we looked at social networks, and we had a discussion on that, right? Uh, what is the size of your social network, and how close are you to other people in your social network, okay? And so social networks uh, are important in the area of social functioning. Now, culture, um, as it relates to these other things that I've talked about, uh, is an individual difference, like I said, but culture affects the way you think, right? Culture affects the way you remember events, and culture affects your social functioning, okay? Now, the question is, uh, and this has been asked in research 
many, many times before, does culture affect one's personality? Okay. Now, the answer to that depends on researchers' views on whether we really have universal traits around the globe, around all cultures, or not. Okay. Uh, Schwarzer said that individual differences in conduct or personality are narrowly context dependent. In other words, they depend on the context that you're in, in terms of the way you conduct yourself. And that those behaviors do not generalize across contexts. And so global traits, personality traits, do not exist, okay? So in this view, uh, culture has an extensive impact on personality. Now, if we take the opposite or kind of conflicting view, like McRae and others who came up with the big five personality traits, they said that studies of heritability, in other words, what's passed down to people in their genes, uh, limited parental influence, um, structural invariance across cultures and species, and temporal stability all point to the notion that personality traits are more expressions of human biology than products of life experience. So personality is uh, traits are variously uh, inherited, okay? Mostly inherited. And, you know, studies of twins have kind of bore, bore, this, bore this out, bore this out, okay? Uh, you know, about 60% of why people uh, are extroverted, for example, comes from, uh, you know, inheritance from the genes. Okay, so if one or a couple of parents or one or a couple of grandparents are extroverted, then it's, it's very probable, at least 60% of that, uh, that you will probably be extroverted too. Okay, the other 40% depends on uh, environmental factors, okay? But, you know, McCray et al. has a pretty good point in terms of personality being uh, something that is inherited, okay? And so in this view, you take that view that traits uh, are stable across, uh, you know, many individuals because of irritability, then culture has little impact on personality according to that view. Okay? So it depends uh, how you look at personality in terms of how culture can or cannot affect your personality. Now, I have three take home points here from the course. Um, if you think about it, adolescents and emerging adults have brains that are blooming and pruning. In other words, they're making all sorts of new uh, connections. And then uh, some of those connections are dying away depending on environmental experiences. And so we can say that brains of adolescents and emerging adults are kind of plastic. They respond to the environment and to habit changes and all that, okay? And so, you know, they're constantly kind of developing, okay? Now, adult cognition does not just generally decline. That's another misnomer or folk tale um, about adults. We don't just generally drop off in terms of our ability to function cognitively. There are some cognitive elements that do decline, like your sensory functioning or your processing speed, okay? Because our neurons do kind of uh, deteriorate over time. They're not as uh, efficient, right, uh, over time. And so we lose some... Uh, some ability to be fast at processing information or to function uh, with our senses. <coughs> Excuse me. And those depend on the architecture of our brain, right? The quality and efficiency of our neurons and neural connections. But there are some cognitive functions that uh, 
are sort of like software, like where our vocabulary or our verbal functions, okay? And they really don't decline. In fact, sometimes increase uh, as we get older because we become uh, more facile in our ability to communicate based on, you know, repetitive kinds of communication exchanges uh, that we've had over life, okay? And so that's kind of the software of the brain. It doesn't depend as much on uh, the hardware of the brain. And so cognition generally just doesn't decline or stay stable or increase, but different types of cognition are dependent upon, you know, the architecture of the mind or the software of the mind. Now that's the second take home point. The third take home point, and probably from every psychology course you take and you understand this, our psychological makeup and our psychological focus impacts our health, okay? Physical and mental health, all right? And so let's say that, I don't know, we have a, an injury, right? Or we have a health concern, um, you know, the way we respond to that injury or health concern has a lot to do with how quickly uh, we will heal, okay, or bounce back uh, from that health concern. And it's the same with any kind of mental health concern, okay? If we work through the mental health concern, say with a counselor or with a psychiatrist, and we have a positive kind of outlook on uh, the way we're going to come across the situation, then you know our psychological focus should be on a positive kind of uh, outcome, okay, for anything that we're up against, okay. And intelligent people can adapt to sometimes dark circumstances, right, in their lives. And they understand that on the other side of that adaptation is some kind of positive nugget that we might have, right? A positive kind of outcome that we might have even in really dire circumstances, okay? And so it's interesting that you know, it depends on your psychological focus. If you're negative about situations, then of course, maybe you won't ever get across that chasm or abyss, right, that we're facing. But if you're positive about, uh, you know, your psychological focus is positive, then you'll see, you know, kind of the bright side of the outcome. Okay, that will eventually occur for you. And so, you know, this is interesting in terms of just the valence of the way you approach life. Okay. And the valence, uh, you know, is very important for your uh, longevity in life. Okay. Uh, now, the Nun study, which we didn't study in this course, I don't think. Uh, Autopsied the brains of uh, 678 uh, nuns who were in Minnesota, and uh, they had written uh, uh, essays when they were 18 and just coming into the convent. And they found in the study that uh, nuns who wrote kind of positively valenced essays as they came into uh, the sisterhood early on had kind of more healthy brains at death than uh, and lived longer, right? Than other nuns who didn't have such a positive take on life as they entered uh, the nunner, the sisterhood. Okay, so you know, being positive about life really gives you a. Uh, uh, Kind of a leg up, right? When you're coming across kinds of negative situations in your life, okay? And it will help you to live longer if you become really positive about uh, how you will approach problems and 
what's on the other side waiting for you, okay? That's important. And so I just wanted to give you that as the third take home point uh, that I want you to leave with in this course, okay? All right, now I have really enjoyed this course and I've enjoyed your work in it. I hope you've enjoyed it too. If you have comments about anything in the course, I'd like to improve this course for the future. And so do your course evaluation and write comments in there and tell me, you know, uh, I like this, but I think you could improve the course by doing this, okay? That's important to me as a teacher and it really reflects, uh, you know, the quality of students who write comments and, and not just say Dr. Bond is great, but, you know, I want to know well, what are some things that I can improve in the course? Okay. So in Canvas, you'll find these course evaluations. I want you to do those. And that will be your last task for this semester. Okay, so I'll start calculating all the grades uh, pretty soon. And I'll get those in uh, very soon as well. Okay. I want to thank you for everything all of your positive support uh, and really hard work in this course, okay? All right, I will see you or I won't at some point in the future, but if you ever need help or a recommendation or anything like that, uh, save my email, okay? Take good care of yourselves and I'll say bye-bye for the last time. Okay, bye-bye.